Welcome to the Collecting Keys Friday Focus. Hey there, welcome back to another episode of the Collecting Keys Friday Focus. If you're new here, these are the episodes where Mike or I just spend a few minutes taking a deep dive on a specific topic, something that's relevant to the industry or going what's going on out there in the market or something top of mind for us in our business throughout the week. And today I will be your host, Dan Austin. And today is about two weeks before the infamous tax day where all of us real estate investors rejoice because we're so excited to tell everybody that we have broken the tax code and we are efficiently investing our money at the most tax advantage way possible. Or at least we think we do. Honestly, 99% of us think we know what we're talking about when it comes to taxes, but the tax code is so big and robust. You really do need an accountant, a CPA that understands this stuff, which I am not, and I will put that up front. You should definitely talk to a tax advisor before taking anything from this podcast as I always say, and you hear me quite a bit on on the podcast actually bringing up taxes because that's something that really, as I've dove into becoming a real estate investor, have talked about. And so today I actually want to talk about that. Um, some of the some of the top things you hear about and maybe break some myths for you or explain into detail how you can utilize some of these tax benefits as a real estate investor, as a real estate business owner. And first, we're going to talk about expenses versus capital and write-offs. And this is where I want to queue up. If anybody watches uh, Schitt's Creek or has watched it in the past, where David has explained to his dad what write-offs are. Is that a new lamp? Yeah. I'm thinking of bringing homeware into the store, so that's a write-off. That's a write-off? Yeah. Do you even know what a write-off is? Uh, yeah. It's when you buy something for your business and the government pays you back for it. Oh. And who pays for it? Nobody. You write it off. Who writes it off? I don't know. The gover- the write-off people. What? Why are we having this conversation? I think it's funny, and it's kind of what most people have the challenge and the misconceptions of understanding taxes. Write-offs are one of them. But anyhow, we're talking about write-offs. We'll talk about depreciation, 1031 exchange deferral, being a real estate business and some of the advantages of that. And then lastly, I'll just highlight real estate professional, which I know you all have heard me talk about on the podcast and the great advantages of that. So I'll lightly touch on that again. Anyhow, let's dive into write-offs. People say that is a tax advantage. Yeah, but it's also an expense, right? So when you report your taxes from, say, a single rental property, you're going to have what's called a Schedule E on your 1040 form, which is the form you submit for your federal income taxes. And that Schedule E outlines how much money did you make on that property? So your rents, how many rents and fees did you collect associated with your rental property and say that's $10,000. And then it provides categories for qualified expenses, which are like mortgage interest, insurance, property taxes, utilities, your maintenance, lawn care, all the things that cost you to run that uh, or operate that rental property fit into that expenses bucket, right? And so then you have, say you have $9,000 in expenses. So you profited or your gross revenue is 10,000, not profit, um, 10,000. You have $9,000 in expenses. You made $1,000 off that rental property and you're going to get taxed on that $1,000 based on your income tax bracket. Sounds like pretty simple there. Where people get caught up on that piece of it is a capital expenditure versus a actual write-off. And a write-off is not a tax benefit technically, I guess it is, but it's money you didn't, you saw and you spent anyway. So it wasn't profit to you. Right. But with expenses, what I just listed are all expenses, but where they get challenged is like the maintenance versus capital improvements. And so when you hear about Mike and I talking about analyzing a property, we put set asides, which are OPEX and CAPEX, operating expenses and capital expenditures. Capital expenditures are big things like roofs, furnaces, windows, um, carpet, all that sort of stuff. So you technically can't write some of those things off as an expense. Now, there's some tax laws that say you can write off anything below $2,500 and those sorts of things. And you should dive into those and talk to your CPA about what that means. There's also depreciation rules for everything. And we will talk about depreciation next. And depre- capital expenditures get depreciated where operating expenses or like maintenance and utilities and stuff, those get expensed in that year. So that was that $9,000 in expenses got expensed totally. Now, if you had a new roof that cost you $9,000, now that's going to get capitalized. That's going to add to the asset value. And that comes in to play right here where I want to talk about depreciation, which is a huge tax benefit to real estate. Depreciation is essentially the government giving you a write-off every year 
for your property depreciating. It kind of needs, it gets wear and tear. It falls apart a little bit every year. Um, it ends up being like 3.8% or something like that. I, I can't remember exactly what it is. But essentially, if you go and buy a house, say it was $100,000, then the government says $100,000 minus the land value. So the purchase price minus the land value actually gives you the structure value. You divide that by 27.5 years, which I said, like I said, it's like 3.8% or whatever per year. And that's what you get to write off as an expense every year for your income. So hypothetically, in our example, where you collected $10,000 in rents, you had $9,000 in expenses, so you profited $1,000. Well, say your depreciation is exactly $1,000. Boom. Now you pocketed, you actually put $1,000 in your pocket, but the government's saying you don't have to pay taxes on that because depreciation is an expense. Awesome. One of the best benefits about real estate. I love it. It's, it's fantastic. But when it comes to those capital items that I was telling you about earlier, some of them have to get added to that basis of the property. So if you do install a new furnace and it costs you $10,000, you don't generally expense that in the year. That gets depreciated over a specific time, which I think, but don't, don't quote me, it's like 27.5 years. Um, there's some intricacies like carpet is five years. But if it's glued down, it's 27.5 years. And so there's some differences. And I don't understand exactly all of them to explain to you. But just know that when you're doing big, large projects, those actually get added to the basis of the property and get depreciated at a different rate, depending on what it is. It's not always 27 and a half years. So you hear about something called cost segregation, typically on larger multifamilies, but you can, they are low cost solutions now on like single family residentials. If you own a portfolio, it becomes a little bit more valuable. Like say you have 10 properties to do this on. And that's essentially a cost segregation service or engineer you pay comes in, they look at all the different items in your home from the outlets to the carpet, to the windows, to the roof, to the furnace, and they apply a value to that and a depreciation schedule. So you're going to, instead of just flat depreciating the whole property at 27.5 years, like right when you buy it, they're going to have a bucket of a five-year depreciation. So maybe you have, you know, $25,000 of five-year depreciation. So you take 25 divided by five, and now you get $5,000 every year for the next five years in depreciation, as opposed to having to divide that whole bucket by 27.5, right? So it allows you to accelerate a ton of the depreciation. And so now, instead of getting a $1,000 write-off, maybe you got a $5,000 write-off and showing you as a $4,000 loss in our, our fictitious example of 10,000 in revenue, 9,000 expenses, which leaves you with $1,000 profit, boom, 5,000 in depreciation now drops that profit to a $4,000 loss. Although you still put that $1,000 in your pocket, keep that in mind. That is a next level technique a lot of people are starting to use and focus on that, that become a little bit more seasoned in real estate investing. Um, but just recognize depreciation, as I explained it to you, as a really good benefit to real estate that you get no matter what when you buy properties. So while we're on the topic of depreciation, let's talk about a 1031 exchange tax deferral. So when you buy a property, say you buy a property and you own it and you pay it off. And during that time, you own it for 27.5 years, the, the house is paid off and all of it's depreciated. You can no longer depreciate it because you've now depreciated the entire value of that $100,000 home. Well, there's something called depreciation recapture. Meaning if you sold that house for $100,000, you'd have to pay a long-term capital gains on that entire $100,000 because it's completely depreciated. And they're basically saying there's no value to it. So when you sell it, anything above that is a profit to you. Well, in order to avoid paying long-term capital gains on that, you can do what's called a 1031 exchange tax deferral. So say you sell that property, it's sold, um, just closed. You now have 45 days to identify up to three different properties that you're going to roll that $100,000 profit into. And, and you have to close on one of those within 180 days. So you, you can pick up to three, but you have to close on one and you have to, within 45 days, and you have to report that to the government. And then you have to find the, or close on the next property, 180,000 or 180,000, 180 days. And that property has to be like for like. So if it's real estate, it needs to go to a real estate property. You can't go and sell it and buy some other asset like a tractor for a farm or something like that. Um, and it must be of equal or higher value. Those are the rules. Um, the great thing about this is now you just avoided paying capital gains 
on any profit above selling that property. So say in this example, you bought the house for 100,000, you sold it for 200,000 and you had depreciated it all the way to zero. So now you're gonna pay long-term capital gains on 200,000. This avoids capital gains on the entire thing. And then the cool thing about this is, is you just keep 1031ing as you please. And then if you don't actually ever pay taxes on that, you always just keep rolling it into another 1031. When you die, your heirs or your children, they get that property tax-free. They do not have to pay any of the taxes, which could be a massive tax bill over, say, a 30, 40-year career of investing. They, it automatically steps up to the current value. So say you started out at 100000 and now you've got a $2 million property. They don't have to pay any taxes on that recapture of any of those the depreciation or 1031 exchanges or anything like that. So that's the huge, really cool benefit. You just completely defer taxes for an entire generation. Okay, so we've talked about write-offs, the expenses versus capital. We've talked about depreciation. We've talked about how to avoid paying taxes on that depreciation recapture via the 1031 exchange tax deferral. Now quickly, I wanna talk about if you're a business owner in real estate, it could be any business, but in, a lot of our listeners are running wholesale businesses or flipping businesses or off-market real estate businesses. One of the great thing about being a small business owner is that um, you can actually avoid paying a lot of the income tax, or sorry, rather payroll tax that you would normally have to pay as a company, right? That you would pay for an employee. So for you, if you want to be uh, avoid paying as much um, employment tax as possible, because you do have to pay self-employment tax, even if you're the boss and you're the owner of the company, you have to pay that. You can identify as a S-corp, and within that, you can designate a reasonable salary to yourself, whatever that is, a reasonable salary to yourself, and you're going to end up paying about 15% of payroll tax on that. And that's you know you, what typically your employer pays part of that, and you as an employee, it comes out of your paycheck typically. So that roughly is about 15%. And then you have to pay income tax on the rest of that. So when we talk about that, we're talking about um, unemployment, Medicare, Social Security, all that sort of stuff that comes out. Um, that's about 15% of your paycheck. So you designate a reasonable salary. And then as the owner, you can take owner draws throughout the year above and beyond that, as long as it's reasonable. And that avoids that 15% payroll tax and you just pay regular income tax on it. So that's a quick way to save 15% on your income. So that's just a side note benefit when you're running a business, like I said, wholesaling, flipping or anything like that, you should look into that, making sure that you're being the most efficient you can with your income tax. And then lastly, the last point I want to talk about was the real estate professional. And that's when you are actively working in real estate and are considered a real estate professional, which means you actually do real estate work, which is work that the IRS tells you is considered real estate work. And you work at least 750 hours a year in that profession. And it's your main profession, meaning if you have a W-2 job, you'd probably like a full-time W-2 job working 2,080 hours a week, you would need to prove that you're working 2,081 hours a year rather in real estate. And you'd have to track all that to prove that out. But what that allows you to do is take those passive losses and apply them to your active income. So for example, if you're pulling a W-2 off of your real estate business and you're depreciating your portfolio, like in our earlier example, where we actually had more depreciation than we did profit, you can now take that additional, in our example was $4,000 in losses, and you can apply that to your W-2 income. So say maybe you gave yourself $100,000 of your W-2 income. Well, now that W-2 is instead of 100,000, the government only tax you on 96. And you can see how this scales to the point where many, many real estate investors actually don't pay any income tax because they are able to write off through depreciation and real estate professional status, all of their active income, as well as all their passive income. So I've blabbed on for a little bit longer than I usually do, but there's just a lot of detail with these taxes and the nuances. And again, we're coming up on tax day. And so if some of this is new to you and you own rental property or you run a business in real estate and you're like, oh my gosh, I did not know this existed definitely talk to your CPA and make sure you're getting the best bang for your buck on all these sorts of things. Um, I've had people tell me like, well, I just delayed my depreciation. Sorry, you can't do that. I figured that out the hard way. And so making sure that you're getting your depreciation put on um, your 1040 and through your schedule E and all that sort of stuff is important. Talk to your CPA, check anything I said, fact check anything I said. I don't know how, much, how accurate it is. I'm not going to claim anything but I do know these are things that I have looked into research and talked to my CPA about. So you should definitely take a look at them. If you haven't started investing and these 
this tax benefit discussion did not motivate you, I don't know what will motivate you, but literally you can get to a point in real estate and it's not that hard where you're not paying any taxes, which you know what, another wrong with paying taxes, we need people to pay taxes, but if there's loopholes and there's ways for you not to, that means the IRS and the government is actually incentivizing you to go to those loopholes because that takes out a huge chunk of money you would otherwise have to pay the government, right? So say maybe it's 30 grand. Maybe you were in your old W-2 job, you're paying 30 grand. Well, you go into real estate and the way, if you can use these tax benefits and you can write off all that 30 grand from your taxes, you're not having to have it, not literally write off, but you're not having to have to pay that 30,000. You can leave your W-2 job and make $30,000 less if you want, or you can make $30,000 more, however you want to look at it in that mentality. It's, that's a huge chunk of money and it goes up and scales to millions of dollars for a lot of people um, that are really big time in real estate. So that's all. If you liked this uh, or you want to know more details about it, hit me up on Instagram, Investor Man Dan. I'm not the tax expert, but I definitely can point you in the right direction and at least explain to you some of the things that we've been able to leverage. Um, if you want to know what know how to do what Mike and I do, you want to get into the um, off-market real estate game, go to Instant Investor. I always screw that up. Go to collectingkeyspodcast.com and click the Instant Investor button, the little blue button at the top, and you can see the different tiers of the Instant Investor program we have. If you really like what we're putting out here, please give us a five-star review. Send me a picture in the DMs of the five-star review, and I will send you a Collecting Keys podcast shirt and or a BDE shirt if you so choose. Just let me know. Thanks for listening. Catch y'all next week. Thanks for listening to this Collecting Keys Friday Focus. Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts.